So when you go for that data science interview, it is very important that you should be well prepared to answer various kind of questions which can come during that interview. So in last week, one of our learners went for a data science interview in TCS and he has shared with us the list of questions which were asked during the data science interview. So what we will do is in today's video, we will discuss five important questions which were asked during that interview and what's the right way to answer those questions. Let's get started. So the first question which was asked in the data science interview was what is dropout layer? So this dropout layer is the layer which is typically used in deep learning neural networks. So what happens is when you have a deep learning neural network where you have a lot of layers, lot of hidden layers, then that network becomes really complex. And in that case, there is a chance of overfitting. Let's say that you have a neural network. So I'm just drawing some example. Where you have multiple hidden layers. Now such kind of neural network, there is a high chance that it would suffer from overfitting. So here for simplicity, I'm showing just three neurons, but typically you can have 100, 200, 50, it depends on the kind of structure you have, the number of neurons over here. So this makes the overall structure really complex. And in that case, to avoid overfitting, a dropout layer is used. So basically what dropout layer would do is, let's say that I have introduced a dropout layer over here. So it would make the neurons of the previous layer inactive during the forward propagation. So during the forward propagation, the output of those neurons would be forced to be zero. So typically that means that those neurons are made inactive. And this basically helps in avoiding the overfitting because then the neurons in next layer, if let's say that this neuron is predominantly dependent on the output of this neuron to create its output. Then if we force this output of this neuron to zero by making it inactive, then in that particular iteration, in that particular epoch, basically, this neuron cannot depend on just the input from this single neuron. It has to basically get its get to its calculation, get to the feature values based on the input it is getting from other neurons as well. So it reduces the dependency of the neurons on the previous neurons. And this basically helps in avoiding the overfitting. And during the back propagation, in this case, as the output of the neuron was forced to be zero, the weights of these neurons won't get updated. So this is basically a dropout layer, which is used for avoiding the overfitting in neural networks, specifically when we are having large number of hidden layers or a complex neural network. Now, the next question on this was how to tune this dropout parameter. So typically the dropout values are in the range of 0.1 to 0.5. So 0.1 means 10% of the neurons from the previous layer should be made inactive. 0.5 means 50% of the neurons from the previous layer should be made inactive. Now, whether to choose 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.3 or 0.5, it depends on the kind of data you have. So the best way to find the best dropout parameter value on your data set is by trying different dropout values and then looking into the train and uh, test loss score. So that would give clarity around whether which dropout parameter is best for you, because ideally you want a result where as the number of epochs are increasing, your training loss is decreasing and your test loss is also decreasing. So you are trying to find the optimal result where both train and test loss are decreasing as you are increasing the number of epochs. And you don't want to see result where the training loss is less, but on the test data, you are getting a very high loss. That is basically a overfitting example. So you have to try different values of dropout parameter and the dropout parameter value for which you are getting good results. That one you have to choose. So my recommendation is you look into the results as well as the train and test loss curves because that would tell you which dropout parameter is able to avoid overfitting and at the same time give you acceptable results in terms of the accuracy or whatever evaluation metric that you're having. The next question was what is pooling layer? So pooling layer it's typically used in convolutional neural networks because in convolutional neural networks you have high dimensional feature maps which are created based on the image data. And as you have high dimensional feature maps, that also results in a complex neural network. So you want a neural network where the complexity is reduced because highly complex neural network, first thing it takes last time to train and it can result in overfitting. So pooling layer is used for reducing the dimension of the feature maps. Let's say that the feature map I'm getting in a particular layer is having a dimension of, let's say 16 by 16. Now by applying pooling on this, we can reduce its dimension. So there are different types of pooling. So let's say max pooling, average pooling. So in this 16 by 16, we would have in total 16 by 16 cells. 
So I won't draw a complete thing now, but let's say every cell within this would consist of a four by four cell. Now on this, if we apply a pooling with using, let's say max pooling, then every cell in this four by four unit, again, how, how, how you want to apply pooling depends on what kind of a factor you are choosing for pooling, what kind of a cell size you are choosing for pooling. So if I'm choosing four by four without any overlap, then this feature map would be reduced to overall four by four feature map from 16 by 16. And in this every four by four matrix or every four by four feature map would be represented by its maximum value. So let's say in this or in this all 16 cells, the maximum value is let's say 23. Then when we reduce this feature map in a new feature map, all these values are represented by a single value, which is 23. Let's say that in this particular region of four by four cells, we have the maximum value 16 then this per complete region would be represented by a single value 16. So this is called as the max pooling. You can also use average pooling where average of all these values is taken to represent the complete region. So this pooling layer basically helps in reducing the dimension of your feature maps and thus reducing the complexity of the neural network. The next question was on decision tree. What is entropy in case of a decision tree? See, entropy is used for basically identifying the splitting. So which feature should be used for splitting a node in decision tree? So entropy basically represents randomness or impurity in the data. So entropy is represented uh, with the help of the proportion of the data points which are there in that particular class and using the logarithmic of it. So let's say that this is the formula of entropy. Let's say that I have a binary classification problem. I have two classes. And this is how you can represent the entropy. So here P basically represents the proportion of the data points in that particular class. Let's say that in that particular node, we have 100 data points and out of 100 data points, 70 data points belong to class one and 30 data points belong to class two. So basically the proportion of the data points in class one in this case would be 0.7 proportion of the data points in class two would be 0.3. And then based on that, this entropy value is calculated. So entropy basically represents the randomness or impurity in the data. So when you have a case where both the classes are having equal number of samples, in that case, your entropy would be equal to one. When you have a pure classes, let's say that all hundred classes belong to single class, let's say class two and class one is having zero samples at that particular decision node. Then in that case, entropy would be equal to zero. So entropy is impurity. So that would be equal to zero because you have pure classes, classes which are completely separated. And this entropy is used for splitting decision tree. So whenever any splitting decision is made within the decision tree, the feature which reduces the impurity most, so this is calculated using information gain. So information gain is reduction in the entropy by choosing particular feature for splitting a node. So that is basically used for deciding which feature it's giving the best results with respect to the information gain. And that information gain is nothing but the reduction in entropy. So this is the role of entropy in decision tree. The next question was again on neural network. So what is forward propagation? So forward propagation is the step used within the training of the neural networks. So in forward propagation, what you do is you send your data, so you send your features from input to output and Typically, the training of neural network has three steps. First step is weight initialization. So you randomly initialize these weights uh, which are there, which are connecting your, let's say, features and neurons. Then you also have weights in the next layer which are connecting the output of neurons from previous layer to the input of the neuron in the next layer. So here, all you have is are the weight values. So initially, the weights, weight values are initialized using random initialization. And the second step is then forward propagation, where you send data from input towards the output and you calculate those values. So specifically, let's say that these are the features. So those features would get multiplied by the corresponding weight values and those weight values would then come to, let's say this neuron. So this neuron would get weighted combination of all the inputs. Let's say that feature weights are in this case, let's say W01 and these are the features X1 plus W02 plus W03 X3. So these three features would come as a weighted combination of inputs over here. And then neuron would typically apply activation function on this something like let's say sigmoid, relu or hyperbolic tangent based on whatever activation function you're choosing. And that output comes over here and then the calculation keeps on going on till you get the output value. And then at the output in the in case of a back propagation, we calculate the loss 
and that loss is propagated back to update these weight values. So forward propagation is nothing but a step used while training a neural network where we pass our features or where we pass our data points from input to output. And during that, uh, multiple calculations happen with respect to linear combination of the features applied by the activation functions across all the layers. So these were the questions which were discussed during a data science interview. I hope you have clarity now. And if you see these questions, four out of the five questions were on neural networks. And there were other questions as well. But in the interest of time, we are covering only the important questions, which I thought you should be prepared for any data science interview. So I hope you got clarity now in terms of how to answer these questions precisely. You have to answer the questions in just two to three minutes, every question. You don't have to, let's say, answer in two lines. That is very short. And please don't make an essay, don't and keep talking about it for 5-10 minutes for every question. That's the way in which you should answer any data science question. Now, unless, let's say sometimes what can happen that interviewer can tell you, okay, on, on this particular topic, I want to get in depth. Can you tell me more? Then you can st start speaking in detail. But generally speaking, for any technical question, answering it within 2 minutes is a good time frame. Thanks for watching this video, guys. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.